Good afternoon, everybody. I can see my excellent. Hi. Um, I'm going to give you some insights, maybe some tips and tricks on how to do BTA um, from our about 11 year experience. It is now the mainstay of our medial uh, medializer in our practice. I have nil disclosures. So what is Botox? We all know about it. Some of you may use it for other areas, but for those of you that don't really use it in your practice, it's a neurotoxin that's been used for over 40 years. As we all know, everybody wants it for their face and other things, but it actually has a really important role for other, a lot of other important medical conditions, including migraines, cerebral palsy for their muscle relaxation and uh, elongation, bladder disorders, uh, and now complex ventral hernias. And I'd like you all to leave this room thinking, how can I add this to my hernia practice? So how does it work? It works at the neuromuscular junction. So this is a normal neuromuscular junction and it fires when you have release of the vesicles containing the acetylcholine, um, choline into the junction. Botox or botulinum toxin A works by disrupting that so that the acetylcholine vesicles are not released and therefore you don't um, initiate a, a, a muscle a contraction. It lasts for about six to eight weeks and actually potentially longer. In our patients we find we get somewhere between four and six months, probably dose related because we give it a lot more volume and uh, units than you would do for your face. But it gives the muscle a flaccid paralysis. That is the muscle relaxes, it elongates and it doesn't contract for the duration of the effect. It probably gives a maximal effect in the abdominal wall around the two to four week mark. We don't really know the optimal timing, um, but you do want to leave it in a little bit longer than what we would initially published on. We initially published for about two weeks, 10 days, two weeks. We're now stretching that out to four weeks pre-op and getting very good relaxation in the majority of cases. So this is our technique. We do it in an outpatient setting. People walk in and walk out. They don't need, they need minimal observation. We don't have any observation machines. And we do it under ultrasound guidance. In fact, we do it in our own clinic rooms. We do six injections per, oh, sorry, three injections per site, so six in total. And depending on what you have access to, whether it's uh, Botox or Dysport, we roughly use uh, one vial or two vials, depending on, on how you get it uh, from your pharmacy. We use 100 per side of Botox, 250 per side of Dysport. We now only inject the oblique muscles, the external oblique and internal oblique. And to do that, we use a volume of around 15 mils. If you wanted to include the transversus in your injections, take your total volume up to 20 mils per, inject, per uh, syringe because you want that volume, that liquid, to dissipate through the muscle so that it spreads throughout the muscle. So volume is important. And in fact, it's the one thing patients say they feel really tight afterwards, and that's the volume effect within uh, each fascial layer. And as I said, we now do it around the three to four week pre-op mark. This is the man that's taught me everything I need to know, one on hernias and two on Botoxing. So this is uh, Nabil Ibrahim showing you how we do it just in our rooms with a bit of betadine skin prep um, with a 20 mil syringe, a spinal needle. You need the depth, particularly for your bigger patients. And our sonographers help guide the needle in. And this is a real-time video of a single injection site. So the three muscle layers are actually quite easy to see. You see their fascial layers. And as the fluid instills, you can see the muscle fill or the, the space around the muscle fill. And what you want is the volume to then dissipate through that muscle sheath. So we go in, identify the muscles you want, go deep and infiltrate as you come out. The big trick for those that don't do ultrasounds if, is either to get your uh, radiologist that likes doing injections to do it, um, or if you start doing it in your room, sometimes that layer between the um, superficial fascia 
and the uh, external ob oblique looks like a muscle layer, don't inject that. It doesn't work if you don't inject it into the muscle. Okay. What do patients feel? For the first 24 hours or so, they feel nothing. In fact, they often say, nothing happened. But day two post-op, they suddenly feel bloated. And that is the beginning of that muscle going to sleep and starting to elongate. So some women say they feel pregnant again, but they know they're not. Other men just feel really bloated. They do commonly say their sneeze, their cough is weaker, so they cannot get that increase in the intra-abdominal pressure to give a really good cough or huff. Some people say it does affect micturation if they need to really bear down to micturate or defecate. Um, if you've got patients that already have lower back problems, it can make it worse. And we now very much tell our patient, our older patients that already have <laughs> back issues, whether it's hernia related or other thing related, your back pain may get worse. We now use a binder, which just gives that external support to try and mitigate some of that. And certainly our back pain patients really appreciate the binder. We also ask them not to do too much in the way of exercise. You've knocked off your oblique muscles. There's nothing you can do to exercise those while they're flaccidly paralyzed, but also you've actually taken out some of the stabilizers of your spine. So you don't want them to overload their spine as well. So you don't want them doing their sit-ups anymore. You want to pair some of that back. They can keep walking, they can keep doing their aerobic exercise, but they need to pair back any of their abdominal wall crunches or whatever they do for their core exercise. And we keep that going post-operatively as well, the binder, the no core exercises, because you've lost that muscle function temporarily. So what do you get? And really the big thing is to look at the images on your right. Uh, the pre-BTA are above, the post-BTA are, are below. They thin, they elongate, and the muscle wall starts to do what the muscle wall is supposed to do by keeping the contents in. It changes the dynamic quite consistently. And as I've got less than a minute, I'm going to just take you through. This again is a different patient pre and post BTA. So we've been imaging our patients heavily um, before and after Botox to show very clearly this quite dramatic effect. And this is a third patient. Patients, uh, people that do get a minimal uh, BTA effect, epigastric hernias, the, the oblique muscles don't release well for epigastric muscles, so you may find you don't get as good relaxation for them. Um, and also anybody with subcostal incisions, so they've denervated that side of the abdominal wall, you may find you don't get good um, relaxation there because those muscles are already denervated. But certainly Botox the other side. This is a real-time video, so most of our practice is minimally invasive surgery, and this is a person with about a 12 centimetre defect, and I'm hoping we'll have enough time, my time is up, to see these muscles just coming back. And that's what we see with most of our Botox patients. We can medialise those muscles very quickly, and this person has not had a component separation. Thank you. I think we will take the questions at the end. Thank you so much. Very glad to be here. And so I'm talking about progressive pneumoperitoneum, the PPP. Uh, no disclosures for this talk. So where are we now today in PPP? It was introduced in 1947 by Nyongi Moreno, published in uh, Surgery. And uh, where do we stand in 2021? And we have this recent meta-analysis done and this review uh, article too. And in contrast with the longevity of the technique, the heterogeneity in the indications and technical variants is remarkable. And that is true because even now today, there is a lot uh, there is a lot of difference between us. What volume, what, which gas, um, how do we do it, um, for how long? Uh, and these are, these are all things that are not very clarified in the, the literature, and we need to step up and maybe uh, gain some, some you know, 
define literature and come to some consensus that are lacking in the literature. It is an evasive technique, and of course it can lead to serious complications, hemorrhagic complications, bowel perforation, pneumomediastinum, uh, pneumothorax. Uh, there was a case that I found that describes portal uh, pneumatosis after PPP. Subcutaneous emphysema, usually not a big deal, but uh, uh, um, actually more of a, a razor of uh, something is not that right. Respiratory distress, DVT, and in the literature, very rare, but I found three cases of death during PPP. So uh, in my unit, how do we do it, our protocol? And um, uh, I didn't put this for you to learn Portuguese because it's a little difficult. Um, but just for you to see that we have everything written down for today, uh, the material you use, how we do it, every step, so it can be reproduc reproductively. And uh, um, one year from now, I can compare what I used to do with my new protocol if I have one. We use it on uh, loss of domain hernias, Tanaka, bigger than 0.25 or Sabbath, be, uh, greater than 20. We actually cal always calculate both. And we always do the DVT prophylaxis before. This is one of the cases, the usual cases that you, we always see in loss of domain. 60, six year old lady, Tanaka 0.7. And we did BTA four weeks prior to surgery, and then we had to do the uh, um, the PPP. How do we do it now? Uh, I use I, I've done it, uh, uh, I'm used to use ultrasound guided things. You know, I, I was born uh, as a surgeon to do ultrasound guided procedures in my previous hospital, um, but still, uh, as complications, these are very complicated patients. Um, I prefer to go now with the various ultrasided, ultrasound guided, so it can be a little uh, 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 more safe. Puncture away from the sac, of course, uh, and heavy scarring away from two. Build a safe uh, air pocket, and then introduce the uh, another needle with a CVC catheter. And now we are going to have this various needle that we can use to put right away the Seldinger technique and don't uh, have to uh, puncture twice. And, and do not do not want the catheter to stay in the hernia sac. You don't want pneumo in the hernia sac. Always put the binder anyway, so you can really enlarge the abdominal cavity. That's what you look. and. And when you do the control CT scan, look for signs in the way where bowel behaves, seeing this CT where that bowel didn't came down. So, and in the surgery, that bowel was almost perforating the skin and I had to do enterotomy. And I was expecting this because I look at the CT and it was really odd how the only bowel that didn't come down was that one that have really severe additions. And sometimes it is not possible or is a very complicated patient, uh, or I tried to do it my way and I failed it. So I have my backup intervention radiology team. And um, it's very important to debrief with radiology before if they don't know the procedure, because actually uh, I had this patient, it was for the last couple of years, it was the only complication we had with PPP. And it was, I asked the radiology, I was not there, so I asked them to put the catheter, but someone that put it was not used to this uh, procedure. So he put a pigtail, and as you see, he put it with the hole, some of the holes were in the abdominal wall. And this patient, he did PPP, and he started to develop emphysema, so uh, uh, I got in and I said, oh, this is not right, let's see, and CT. The, the guy, and he had actually, what the PPP did is was destroying my abdominal wall, uh, the lateral abdominal wall. So now because of the PPP, I had even a bigger problem than before. And uh, I did operate on him, did a tar, reconstruct the, bo the bowel, and uh, you can see some asymmetry. At the end, it was not so bad, but this was really an unusual complication that should not have been happening. And sometimes even with the, the help of radiology can be tricky. You can see this patient, he had a big inlay interperitoneal mesh, 
and um, we try to do the PPP, but he only stays there, and we could not. We could go from the side, but we could not understand it, what's going on. And in the um, the surgery, I could understand because this was a, a mesh that I never seen, and it has like these two layers. So the PPP was getting in just in between these layers, and we could not get in the abdomen. Uh, so uh, the important questions really to address uh, regarding PPP uh, is uh, besides the way we do it, it doesn't matter as long as you do it right, it can be you, it can be your team, it can be radiology, you can take into the OR in difficult cases. Um, but the real question is how long before surgery? Um, my protocol, I tend to, to do it 14 days before surgery. I schedule 14 days, and sometimes that gives me time to prep, to prep if things don't go the way I want it. So if patient cannot do it uh, 14 days before, I still have some time until the 10th day. That's uh, usually my cutoff. How much air to go in? Uh, my protocol now is uh, I try to do three times the volume of the hernia. And sometimes, like in the first hernia that I showed, this can be a very huge volume. And even divided into administrations can be tricky, and the patient cannot tolerate it. So record everything, uh, how much volume you are, you are installated every day. And uh, most of my uh, patients, they do PPP as outpatients, uh, and they go to outpatient clinic three times to check if everything is OK. But of course, they have my number, because if they start with weird symptoms or something is going wrong, they can reach me right away. And never forget antithrombotic prophylaxis, because that's really, really important. But this PPP is a game changer. You just need to use it right, because in cases of loss of domain, sometimes with just the reefs, you can go for it. Thank you so much. have one uh, disclaimer about uh, uh, a manufacturing of uh, soft tissue as uh, a, a new su a mesh suture. Okay, so how do we get uh, from the above, above images to the bottom one? Well, if you look, this patient had a one-sided unilateral release, and on the right side, you can see the circle, the volume of the side that had the external oblique is bigger than the circle that didn't have an external release. The anterior components, here you have a hernia. If you just close the clamshell, you lose volume. But if you do releases, the clamshell opens and you increase your volume. And we published this in the Annals of Surgery uh, not, oh, I don't know, 15 years ago, showing that the anterior components does recruit uh, volume without elevating the diaphragm and without hurting your pulmonary function tests. So anterior components for loss of domain increases the volume without a measurable change in pulmonary function. It works to reclaim lost domain. So the, some of the soft tissue lessens. Primary abdominal wall closure is always better than bridging. And if, this is my lesson, if there is unreliable skin closure, you must partially close the hernia defect so that the skin edges will come together in the midline. And then if I have unreliable skin, then I'm going to either use a biologic or mesh strips, but I would avoid a planar prosthetic mesh. This is my patient uh, at the Veterans Hospital. He had an open wound after one of my colleagues' laparoscopic uh, eye palms. I closed the wound first with a skin graft, and <laughs> less than a year later, this is what he looked like. Just a massive defect. But this, here's the lesson. The skin cover is unreliable. Bringing those skin edges together, you'll have some scabby wound healing or it will fail to heal. If you have exposed mesh with bridging, it better be a biologic. A 17 centimeter defect, but much of his volume is outside. So, and it's also a non-compliant abdomen. It does not reduce when I put it in. I gave him Botox. I, it was done at the Veterans Hospital. I don't know how to, good a job they did. 
I canceled it as surgery the, the morning of surgery because it just didn't feel compliant enough. We rebotoxed him. It was better. He also got a very good bowel prep, so there's not a lot of intraluminal stool. And if I was going to bridge, which I did in him, I used a biologic because in case the skin closure broke down. This is not the same patient because I didn't have a picture. I was working so hard. I was with my PA, not even a resident. But you can see from this post-op image, here is an 11 centimeter bridging biologic mesh. And that was just enough for me to get his skin closed. This was a stormy recovery because I pushed him as far as you could push a human. He had almost had a compartment syndrome. He was a little acidotic. We got him through that, intubated for two full weeks. But he left. We actually were. He works at the Veterans Hospital. I see him all the time. But then that biologic, as you might expect, over time just continues to stretch out. So now we're going to go for round two. But you see, now I have good skin cover. If I need to, I can bridge him with a prosthetic mesh, if I need to. Did the same thing over again. Botox, great bowel prep, two or three days of just clear liquids. I usually give them PO Dulcolax so that their bowel is all shrunken up. And you can redo a component release. As it's been shown, sometimes the external oblique still is relatively anteriorly, uh, anteriorly located. So you can redo a lateral incision, get under the external oblique, and re-elevate it to improve abdominal wall compliance so the tissues, the rectus muscles can come together in the midline. This is the patient. And this time, I, try, I, thought, I, I thought I was able actually to get him closed. Last time I bridged him with 11 centimeters, and it was two weeks in the ICU. There are other mesh strips are in, two centimeter wide pieces of soft polypropylene mesh used as sutures. And we actually got them closed this time. Took out the redundant skin. No time, didn't even go to the ICU. That initial surgery was like my surgical fascio tens to partially get them closed, get the skin closed in the midline. And then with good skin in the midline, you can do whatever you need to do. So that was uh, seven. That was July last year. The previous surgery had prepared him and his tissues for the primary closure, and here he is uh, in February uh, 2022, and here he is in December. So uh, soft tissue considerations assess your skin closure, and if you know you're going to get your skin closed. Like Dr. Jacobs was saying, you can use breast, you know, you can bridge with prosthetic. There's lots that you can do. But if your skin closure is unreliable, then you have to use a biologic or something that if it got exposed, it wouldn't be a failed operation and a big surgery to remove. And with that, thank you very much. Oh, I have one more just to show. I'm sorry, I forgot. Just to show that wasn't an accident. Bad skin cover, mesh strips. But this time, I thought I could get his skin closed. You could see how scabby that skin healing was. And there he is two years later. Thank you. Uh, thank you, um, Ramesh and the panel. I have the first slide. Um, as you said, I'm an Australian surgeon. I'm from Melbourne. Uh, these are my disclosures, and for this talk, uh, none are particularly relevant. So I'm going to make some assumptions. Firstly, that the patient was actually suitable for an attempted repair of their uh, hernia to start with that they've been optimized in the ways that we've uh, all become accustomed to. In other words, we've hopefully got them to stop smoking, lose some weight, got their diabetes under control and dealt with their other medical issues. That they've had abdominal wall preconditioning, uh, in particular the two things we've just seen, uh, Botox and progressive pneumoperitoneum, and that it's worked because sometimes it doesn't work all that effectively. Uh, and that the plan for reconstruction involves some form of uh, component separation. 
but still occasionally interoperatively you run into these issues. You can't restore domain, you can't get the mesh plane, you can't pose the posterior layer or there, or there are soft tissue issues. So I'm not going to deal with those two because I thought Dr. Germanin was, uh, would have dealt with one of them by now anyway. So if you can't close the abdomen, it's a bit like the uh, PRAC exam in uh, time bomb diffusing. But the most important thing to do is don't panic because there are other options available uh, and I'm going to run through those at the mo for the moment. So the first thing to say is you've got to separate the layers fully. So um, one of the common problems when people do posterior releases that they don't go far enough laterally and they don't go far enough coitad or cephalate. So you need to do a very wide separation of the components. That's what the name of the procedure is. Uh, the diagram is from Yuri Nowitzki's book and you should be able to get you know, 11 centimetres of advancement for that posterior layer on each side. Uh, if you can't, you can bridge, uh, or you can use peritoneum. If it's uh, still present, you can uh, use a biosynthetic agent. Biologics probably have no place because they're expensive and just fall apart. Uh, my favourite biosynthetic is this one made by Gore and we've developed uh, the patch of Stephen, or I should say my young colleague has developed it. So it's like a bilamina. We slot the larger piece inside the peritoneum and then close the peritoneum uh, edge to edge to the other piece, as you can see on the right hand side. So getting the anterior layer closed, you want uh, physiologic tension, you want to use the, the appropriate uh, techniques these days, small bite sutures, long mesh, uh, long uh, suture length, you can use interrupted uh, starting cephalad and cordate if you need to. And again, you've got to ensure full separation of the components. So that means running if you're doing an external oblique from the costal margin to the ASIS. And if you, as I said, if you're doing a transversus abdominis release from up under the diaphragm down inside the Cooper's ligament. And again, you should be able to get perhaps 10 centimetres of advancement of the anterior wall. The next option is a bridge, of course. Uh, we've been bridging for a long time, but I think there are some caveats involving uh, bridges. So these are all cases of mine. You can see relatively small bridges with differing uh, uh, meshes in place. But the short answer is you've got to be able to ensure soft tissue coverage. I think that uh, small bridges are okay. Wider, deeper, longer bridges I don't think work as well. You might want to consider a different prosthesis. If you're putting in a reduced weight mesh, you might want to go to a heavyweight mesh, and you might even want to uh, consider fixation of the prosthesis to stop it moving around. It should always be done as an underlay, never edge to edge. We can do some more fascial releases. So the first person to describe the fascial release was uh, Gibson, who wrote uh, in 1916 in the Annals of uh, Surgery, he was able to get uh, abdomens closed in patients who had large bowel obstructions. I often use the Gibson dart. You can see here the top left-hand picture. Uh, I've incised the anterior sheath of both recti. I've advanced the linear elba to the middle and closed it. And then I've reinforced those uh, incisions with a, a dart, and in this case using a, a synthetic mesh. We can do more fascial releases. Chevrel, who's a famous French surgeon, uh, had great uh, success with doing hernia repairs. You could slightly modify his technique and instead of double breasting your raised flap, you could sew it edge to edge, which gives you again three or four centimetres depending upon how much of the anterior flap you raise. Uh, this is a, another plastic surgical technique where you in fact you use all of the anterior sheath. You take it off the muscle, rotate it over and sew it in the midline. This is an article from a group of Japanese surgeons who had good success with a dozen patients. What about combining anterior and posterior releases? Well, uh, the next speaker's, or the next second speaker is going to tell us all about that. It used to be a hard no, uh, and it uh, might be a maybe, uh, and the beautiful uh, diagrams from uh, Javier Monclou's uh, paper on it. So. So far we've done separation of components, bridging and fascial releases. What about interoperative fascial traction? We've heard a lot about that today. We're going to hear some more about it in a minute. Suffice it to say that I think it's an effective way to go about uh, uh, helping to close the abdomen if necessary. Uh, I've been a big fan of mesh mediated fascial traction because I've been able to use it for a long time. So in these cases, the mesh is sewn or we modify it. We've nearly all our patients have had Botox for these big hernias anyway. Uh, we uh, secure the mesh edge to, not edge to edge, but wrap it around the fascia. And then every uh, two or three days, we take them back to the theatre 
uh, tighten it in the middle. I don't cut the mesh out, I roll it over. I find that's better and it gives you a more secure uh, closure in the middle and eventually you can get them together. Lastly, but not least, there's societal reductive surgery. You could start with taking out the omentum, see if you can get the content reduced. You could then go to taking out a bit of bowel to see if you get the content reduced. And you can just keep working on organs until there's nothing left inside. Probably not great for the patient. But I don't have any issues doing uh, an abdominal wall reconstruction in someone who's had a colectomy on the assumption that there hasn't been a lot of spillage of contaminants and the mesh is going to go in the retrorectal space. It's not going to go inside the abdomen or on the surface. So I think the important thing is to plan well and you shouldn't uh, have too many unclosable abdomens. You can utilise appropriate fascial releases again. You might want to consider cytoreductive surgery if you can't reduce everything into the abdomen. You can bridge. Bridging is a good fallback position. Uh, or you can consider a stage closure with fascial retraction. Thank you. Good afternoon and also thanks to the organizing committee to, 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 to uh, allow us to present the double component separation technique that can be like a forbidden fruit I will explain. So let me, uh, let me come through the, the disclosures. So my first message, please don't do it, you know, that's, you know, that's my AM, please don't do it. But can I take the apple? We have cases like this or like this, and these are one of our series of double component separation. And uh, why? Because it was previously reported that uh, after an unsuccessful anterior recurrence after anterior component separation could be done uh, traversal abdominal release, and this is the paper from uh, Pauli. So this patient had already a combination of anterior and posterior component separation. So we, we also have, we, in our series, we early did like this. This is a recurrence after a posterior component, after anterior component separation. And, and finally, before going to my clinical data, I would like to show you this paper that Jorge Daes also commented this morning about the, um, what is the result of making anterior and posterior in a cadaver lab and also watching the CT scans of the patient after the posterior component separation. And you can see here, this is their conclusion that in, this, in, the, in his paper, he saw this an, an anatomy lesson that despite both making the anterior and posterior, you have two layers still of internal oblique muscle and traversal muscle covering that. And the distance, between the traversus abdominis muscle and the release in the cadaver model, of course, was four centimeters. But what may happen you know, in, in real life? So if we, per, we usually, our first step is try to go uh, and, um, and put a an, uh, retromuscular perpetual mesh, making a tar. Then just in case we need it, then we perform an anterior component separation. But the traction forces laterally, both of the release of the traverse of the muscle and the external oblique muscle may make this, you know, uh, of course, wider in the postoperative period, also in the follow-up of the patient. But it's true that if we're not going to place our mess, we're going to place a 50 by 50 mess, like Guyan reinforcements or the Vistal sac, and it's going to cover with more than 12 centimeters overlap of our both releases on the posterior and anterior component separation. So this is our clinical data that we published and, and was quite controversial and uh, because we, we, we saw the series of 12 patients with this such a very good outcomes, you know, with um, after uh, our follow up, we didn't see yet any recurrence. But as Jennifer always says, you want to see a recurrence, just follow your patient and I'll show you later. So when we cannot close, I completely agree with Rod Jacobs messages. No, we can use bridging, we can use fascia tens, we can make a stage repair, that could be a good idea, that was published in 2008, many years ago. But we can make, like as, as, as Rod Jacobs mentioned also, intradominal resection in our series, eight out of more, more, over 500, and double component separation, now we have already made three more after our initial publication. 
So, in bridging, we may have the problem of pseudo-recurrence, or we can consider a bridge as a stage procedure. But sometimes you cannot do anything more because this patient had a previous uh, necrotizing fasciitis in the abdominal wall, and there was no muscles below the umbilicus. So we have already made visceral resection in some extreme cases like these ones. And I have to tell you, in eight cases, we have had two leaks of the, uh, uh, the, the anastomosis, and one patient uh, died, the, sec the, the patient on the right. So when we are dealing with these kind of monsters, the, one of the problems that we have is that, um, by example, in this lady, we perform our, our tar. We were so happy uh, to, to make the dissection. And, 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 but when I tried to close everything, the anesthetist told me, Miguel, you cannot close that way because the, the patient cannot breathe. I cannot, I cannot breathe the, the, the patient. The plateau respiratory pressure has raised so much. So we made and edit an anterior component separation, as Gregory Dumanian has also remarked, to increase the volume, you know, because it's a problem of continent and continent. So, you know, we need to, this anterior component separation that we did in this lady to increase. And despite that, look at the bridge, you know, despite the posterior, despite the anterior, despite Botox, despite pneumo. So all our tools were displayed in this lady. He went very well. And you can see here the pictures. And after four years, I, I saw this lady a month ago, and after four years, she's so happy because we couldn't reintroduce everything in the abdominal wall. So things may be go wrong because they are very extreme cases. So we have had already had an, an intestinal injury, an, an intestinal injury with an intercutaneous fistula, and the patient had six months on, on hospitalization, and we have to come back to her after one year to repair. And we have one recurrence, you know where? in the inguinal area, probably because that's the more dangerous of the combination on posterior and anterior. Anatomically speaking, if I'm gonna add an anterior compression, what I have learned with this lady is that make more limited anterior component separation in the, in the lower third. So I will stop in the superior. This is what I learned and always learning from our own failures. That's, you know, that's the way to go, yes? And also communicate each other to learn from each other. So this lady, finally, the fail with the intestinal injury, you can see here that we have completely changed his life. And this is the picture that he sent us uh, in the beach last year. So you, we have completely changed the life of this lady. So uh, in, the, in our algorithm, when we cannot close, it's quite similar to Roger Jacobs. So we, when you cannot close, you have to, to think about the, the volume that you have, the volume you want to reintroduce, and look at the intra-abdominal pressure, look at the plateau respiratory pressure, differences, that's so important. And then you have several things to do. You can add a tar, after, can add an anterior component separation to your tar, or you can make a visceral resection, you know, to, to increase your volume, your volume in the, abdominal, in the abdominal content and make a large or bridge repair. I think that's the way, that, that's what we can have. But finally, this is my slide, slide to say you, don't do it, but. In strange cases, from uh, our clinic, following our clinical experience, could be done in experience centers. Thank you so much, and I hope you will enjoy. Thank you for the invitation to be here. It's a great honor for me. I will do something about the intraoperative fascia traction IFT for the treatment of large abdominal wall hernias and incisional hernias, W3. We heard about a lot of things. And these are my disclosures. Can you be a little louder? Yes, I try. It's even better just like that? Yeah, it's Good. better. OK, thank you. These are from our daily consultation. You all know them here, there. This one here with skin graft and here. It was only a little umbilicus hernia two years, uh, 10 years uh, prior. And here's the uh, CT scan of this uh, patient. Here you can see all the available pre- and intraoperative therapies. I don't want to go them through because we heard about that already in the different presentation. Incisional hernias are frequent light complication in abdominal wall surgery. Incidence rate is about 20% one year after laparotomy. And they are a challenge for abdominal wall surgeons. Patients get older and more obese. 
Hernia sizes 10 to 25 and transverse extent are not rare and not uncommon. So the pathophysiology uh, behind that is due to lateralization and shrinkage not only of the rectus abdominis muscles, but also of the three obliques. The hernia becomes increasingly larger and can ultimately no longer be closed without tension. In this extreme form, we have to perform surgical reconstruction, as we have already seen, of the abdominal wall, considerable complications, as we always ha uh, also have seen, complications can occur, some of which are life-threatening. The hypothesis for our upcoming international RCT uh, uh, about the IFT is that the method of IFT, I will show that, is reasonable alternative to previous technique with component separation alone. Facial traction can in particular help avoid the risk inherent of component separation. And we all know that the compo component separation, as especially the one of Ramirez, has wound complication up to 48%. So, let's go to the intraoperative fascia traction to the technique. We need external devices, carrier and the frame and the spring balance. And we want to perform a stretching of the uh, fascias intraoperatively and we do it vertically or di diagonally, crossed. Primary tension free or uh, low tension closure of the abdominal wall is, uh, uh, is uh, uh, requested and it helps to avoid the component dissection. Hernia sac preparation is necessary, adhesolysis only as far as necessary, otherwise leave the second tech you need it at landing as a landing zone between the both posterior layers of the rectus sheaths. Limit the epifacial dissection of the rectus sheaths to 2 to 3 cm because of the circulation. Incision of posterior layer and rectus sheaths for a supply augmentation with a mesh. Then very important is to keep the U-hold sutures, Vicro 1, and in the anterior layer of the rectus sheath longitudinally and one centimeter lateral to the fascia edge with two centimeter stitch length. And then prior to the traction, insert the mesh, which you need in supply, reef stopper position, and uh, lead out the red on drainage from the mesh bed. Here the second part of the technique, then push down the spring balance by hand and achieve a pretension. And then you should uh, lock in the holding sutures in the frame and in the clamps. And then follows the 30 minutes control defined tension on the fascia with 12 to 14 kilograms. Uh, you do vertical, or I, I prefer the diagonal vertical traction. And I do it, I lead out the sutures because I want to avoid large uh, openings, large incision. So I lead the sutures out transcutaneously, as you will see later. Intraoperative measurement of fascia distances under maximal uh, muscular rec uh, relaxation is uh, requested. Also, the intraabdominal pressure should be measured continuously, indirectly, and intravesically. Here you can see how we perform the uh, preparation. This is first the sac preparation, then you will see that we can inc incise the posterior uh, layers of the rectal sheath here with the uh, scissors, with the bipolar scissor, it works very well. And then here we are starting to suture the holding sutures, to insert the holding sutures, one centimeter laterally to the edge and two centimeter stitch length. And here we are going transcutaneously with a modified birchie needle. And as we, and so you can catch the suture and lead it out transcutaneously. So this is done and here the uh, device is completed. So, and here the frame is inserted and here you can see how we are putting in the sutures and the clamps. And now follows half an hour of uh, waiting and traction with every two minutes re-tensioning of the sutures. And when this is done, it is measured the distance between the both layers of the rectus sheath. And then every two minutes is retentioned here the sutures. So, and after half an hour, when time is over, you can detach the frame from the 
device disconnected and so it's falling down. Then you release the sutures from the frame and pull them out. And afterwards you're doing, the, and here you can see the mesh inside. You can see how big the hernia is and how small the incision was. And here we are starting with the suture of the uh, anterior layers. And we do it in small stitch technique with a slow absorbable, slowly absorbable suture. And then it's ready. And then I go on because of the time. Here you can see the steps, preparation of fascia, hernia, sac attachment of traction sutures, then pre-traction, traction sutures, hernia measurement, and the transcutaneous intraoperative traction. Here you can see in the animation uh, how the incision are done and how the preparation is to be done. Especially here, two to three centimeters from the midline. And so the incision of the posterior layer of the rectus sheath, insert the mesh. So I go on. Here once again midline and you see how the sutures are stitched, the holding sutures. So I will go on because of the time. Here this is 10 centimeter distance from the frame to the uh, patient. Here how it's closed afterwards one by one. So you can see how it develops the distance after 25 minutes it's closed. So I go over because uh, the results we have seen uh, out of 90% we gained uh, six, 16 centimeters. Uh, we had a median intraop hernia width of 16 centimeters and gained a height of, uh, significant fascia length of 10 2 centimeter and we could perform a low uh, tension closure in 81 out of 90 uh, cases. That means 90%. And we had a complication. Uh, four, uh, uh, seven out of 90, that means 7.7% and reoperation 4.5%. We had no post-operative abdominal compartment and post-operative VAS was very low. And here I do not want to bore with you, my time is over, so I will come back to the conclusion. Up to now, gain in facial length only possible with different forms of CS, Ramirez, endoscopically assisted, dual CS and TAR. Due to the invasiveness of these procedure, complications are more, more frequent, you know them all. And so in summary, the own overall complication rate of 12, now 8%, and rate of 6% of redo uh, uh, operation appear low in comparison and can most likely be due to the less invasive nature of the facial traction. And the facial traction enables primary closure of complex W3 and LOD hernias and it might uh, be less prone to complications than the other methods of the component separation. Here the references I skim over and now just a result from thank you. It's not a competition to TAR. Thank you for the attention and Hamburg is not the LFA only. Thank you very much, and again, thank you for the invitation. When I was a resident, we would never have approached these. We, we, we would know, have known how to approach these, and a patient like this would have kept this hernia the rest of her life. But now we do these hernias essentially every week in our institution. For the most part, a patient like this that walks in who's seen you know, 10 or 15 physicians, and, and you say there's just no way you can fix this. And, and indeed, this isn't just a hernia. This is actually a peristomal hernia. This is her... This is her midline incision. Her midline incision is off to the side. And that, that <clears throat> bandage that you see there is actually a, a mesh fistula. So if you want to make this hard, it's the largest peristomal hernia I've ever seen. Plus, she's got a, a, a mesh fistula to make it super hard. But it is about the approach in this. I mean, nobody walks in with, a, with an uncurable hernia. This is her CT scan. <clears throat> Here, you can see that her start counting solid organs. Her kidneys are on the inside. The liver looks like it's there, and then the jailbreak starts. And so the, all of her intestine completely out of the abdomen, except this bit of small intestine here because she's got an APR. And there's a spleen, by the way. But it is about having a plan. 
It is about getting the patient ready for surgery, developing a plan, and then following through for it. And then one of the problems, however, is, is some of these patients will actually follow your plan and then you have to operate on them. That's a problem. But she, so she shows up and now you can see that this is a midline incision. You can see her mesh fistula draining off to the side. We use Steinman pins to hold her abdominal wall up. And this is what she looks like. And I will show this video in the Oscars session uh, later today about how we fixed her. But this is after we've, you know, after the operation or as we've done the operation, we've resected the mesh fistula, resected the mesh, put her back together again. We use Botox preoperatively didn't need to do a component separation because she had lost weight prior to her surgery and got her completely completely well. What you need for the most part is to make the hernia smaller. We've demonstrated in our data that for every centimeter of hernia size, you actually increase the chance of recurrence. So our goal is to make the hernia smaller. And how do we make the hernia smaller? We make the hernia smaller by weight loss is number one. So that patient I, that, that I showed earlier, she lost 48 pounds before we operated on her. Absolutely. Neurotoxins of Botox already been talked about, preoperative pneumoperitoneum, uh, if you're so inclined, and we now are more inclined, and then component separation and then I'll say fascia tends uh, at the end. One of the su also super important things to ask your patient, why would you actually undergo an operation? What do you do now? But I sit on the couch and eat potato chips and watch Netflix. What do you do if we get to have you go through this big operation? Well, I'm gonna sit on the couch, watch Netflix, and eat potato chips. Then maybe you shouldn't operate on that patient. But otherwise, take care of the comorbidities, uh, fashion a plan, and have an ICU bed ready for these patients. The size of the hernia itself, and looking at uh, almost 2,000 cases, the size of the hernia, the volume of the hernia itself predicts all the bad things how much it's on outside the abdomen, wound complications, readmissions, reoperations, recurrence, perk drains, and also the length of stay. When we start looking at patients who end up on a ventilator or end up in the ICU with high flow oxygen. Diabetes, interesting, diabetes increases the chance of this, but also asthma and COPD, as you would expect patients who have some compromise of their lungs. But if you start looking at the high risk patient, the high risk patients are those, if you look at the, the percentage down on the far side toward the bottom, that high risk patient, if you have more than 50% outside compared to what's inside, increased chance of the patient ended up in the ICU, either in a, on a ventilator or on high flow oxygen. One thing you also have to, have to recognize is the complexity of these patients. This is a paper on 775 consecutive component separations that we did. One of the things that I like to do in papers is like the, the, hernia, the hernias are this big and they have this much on the outside and they have complications whether they're contaminated or not, diabetes and smoking. And when I start to break down a technique, one of the things that I try and do is skim off all the, all the difficult, all the problematic stuff and say, does my technique actually work in a core group of patients? So what we did here in this, in the paper is we, patients without diabetes, non-smokers, BMI of less than 35 in a non-contaminated field, and guess what? That only left 22% of the patients we operated on. These patients are complex to start with, and you have to understand it, and you have to be aggressive about it. If you develop a wound complication in these patients, if you look at the bottom, you can see the readmission rate is, is significant, more than six times higher and the hernia recurrence rate is more than five times higher with wound complications in these big hernias. So we do these things. It's about diabetes and it's about smoking, it's about weight loss, it's about not having an enterotomy, and it's about if the patient has an infection beforehand trying to take care of it. Because when you attack these big patients and these big hernias, what you think is a problem with, so in this slide, I've divided defects greater than 200 square centimeters and less than 200 square centimeters and looked at, look at the impact of obesity. If you look at the blue, the blue is the smaller hernias. This is statistically different. 30 to 40, statistically different in the blue. The green is much more statistically significant. If you're going to operate on big hernias, you've got to take care of their comorbidities. It's even more important. And then how about diabetes? That was, that was uh, BMI. Diabetes is exactly the same. The larger the defect, the more important the comorbidities. What you don't want to do is end up with these guys. You get one shot at this, and if you develop wound-related complications and failures, it's over for the patient. How about fascial closure? Can we just bridge? They're big hernias, let's just bridge them. 
This is the same paper, that component separation paper, fascial closure in almost 90% where we didn't get fascial closure. Ah, thank you so much. Where we didn't get fascial closure, you can see what our recurrence rate was. Seven times higher. Wound complications are important. Fascial, fascial closure is higher. And this isn't just our data. This is Mike Liang's data from Texas, looking at the, the instance of SSO if, uh, if you don't get the fascia closed. And look at the recurrence rate. Seven times higher for him. Essentially exactly the same chance of recurrence. Seven-fold increase if you don't get the fascia closed. This is uh, Ajita Prabhu and Mike Rosen at the Cleveland Clinic. Redo TAR patients where they didn't get the fascia closed, 46% recurrence rate. So this is what I do in the operating room and preoperatively. This is my algorithm. If you have an eight centimeter defect with no loss of domain and no component separation, where you place your mesh is essentially dealer's choice. A small defect, massive loss of domain, Preoperative Botox, we do just like they do in Sydney, preoperative Botox, and then we'll apply preoperative pneumoperitoneum in these patients. I used to think if you have bigger defects, bigger defects, you'd stretch the skin more. There's great data from France saying that actually it works in bigger defects as well, preoperative pneumoperitoneum. Then component separation is necessary. Eight centimeter to 14 centimeter defects, no loss of domain. If I can't get the admin closed while I'm standing in the OR, bilateral uh, posterior sheath release, cut the posterior sheath to try and get the abdomen closed. If it pulls together, great. If it doesn't, and it's less than six centimeters under tension, I will do a transverse abdominus release, either on one side or both. If it's greater than six centimeters, I need to get the abdomen closed. I will do an external oblique release at least on one side. External oblique release is my go-to for the bigger, bigger defects. And then for the massive defects, it is, we throw the kitchen sink at these folks. Preoperative weight loss is an absolute must. If someone walks in with a BMI of 28, can you get to a BMI of 22 or 23? Even 10 pounds makes a big difference in, in abdominal volume, especially in men. How about this lady? Unfixable. She lost 50 pounds. We skipped the Botox. And in the operating room, transverse abdominus release and completely got her closed. About this gentleman, if you, you look, she, he's got his stomach coming out of his abdomen, his pancreas is coming out of his abdomen. If solid organs come out of your abdomen, that's a bad thing. If you come on down, you can see that essentially he has his mesentery over his major vessels. All of his intestine except for his rectum is out of his abdomen. So what he got was weight loss, Botox, and then a component separation in the OR. This is, he lost uh, almost 40 pounds. This is what, this is a total preperitoneal dissection. This is what Botox gave us in this gentleman. You can see starting to pull this together. That's what Botox gave us. Component separation, or oblique component separation, completely closed, and this is, this is him on the OR table. How about this gentleman? This is just a, a small little ingle hernia, and you'll watch how much volume he had. This is, he has essentially his entire volume in his groin hernia and perforated diverticulitis. If it, let's go. I mean, you gotta get excited about these. One thing about these big hernias, big hernias are like dogs. They can sense fear. You can't go in fearful. <clears throat> so we perk drain this guy. This is, you can see what his, he is, his waist is, his waist is microscopic. He has everything in his groin. So we perk drain, perk drain his, his perforated diverticulitis, come back and put in Botox him with a pneumoperitoneum. And we got him completely closed. Thank you very much. So I'm gonna spend a few minutes and talk about um, some of the technical considerations for doing a retromuscular uh, sugar baker repair. Um, a lot of the considerations are different than when we do intraperitoneal sugar bakers, which uh, Dr. Liu is going to talk about. And so really few of the points I'm going to make, I think are, uh, are relevant to, to his talk. So hopefully there won't be uh, much overlap. All right. So these are my disclosures. They haven't uh, changed since uh, my last uh, presentation. So if you're interested, the very first colostomy was made in 1793 um, on an infant who had uh, imperforate anus. Uh, we've had 230 years to fix that. Uh, it, since that time, and we have not figured out the right way to fix 
hernias that occur around ostomy sites. And so I'm going to talk with you a bit about some technical parts of polyperistomal hernia repair. M most of what I'm going to tell you is kind of how the technique evolved over the course of time. And, and to do that, we have to think a little bit about the, the operations that it's based off of, all right? So Sugar Baker described his first surgery in 1980. This is uh, in um, basically the Journal of American College of Surgeons' original name. Um, he described you know, making a midline laparotomy, uh, taking down adhesions, uh, leaving the hernia sac, and he basically cut the mesh so it filled the fascial defect. He, he essentially did an inlay repair, okay? But what he did was he left a space in the lateral aspect and let the colon sneak up. There's no mesh overlap here, none. So the thing that we think of as a sugar baker repair is not even remotely close to a sugar baker repair. People modified the technique and did something slightly different. He then closed the primary fascia at the end. Now, if you want to look for the first retromuscular peristomal repairs, this is a paper from uh, Alexander and Bilyeu in 1983. They would do an open takedown of the stoma and make a pocket that was retrorectus, and then they would continue the pocket between the transversus and the internal oblique, right? So they made an, they did an intramuscular component separation. They obviously took down the neurovascular bundles, but look, look where their mesh is, right? They've got a big retromuscular mesh. They moved the stoma. They're showing you they moved it from a bad lateral location and put it back through the rectus. And they've reinforced the ostomy with mesh from the very beginning, you know, sort of primary mesh reinforcement, okay? And this looks very similar to how I learned how to do retromuscular repairs. And, and notably, they also said, hey, if you've got a, a hernia in the midline or you want to move it to the contralateral side, you can just do a contralateral retrorectus dissection. So this is kind of the infancy of retromuscular hernia repairs. The way that I learned to do retromuscular peristomals was to take down the stoma 100% of the time and then do a posterior rectus sheath release, do your tar around that, close the old ostomy site, move the stoma to the contralateral side, make a hole in the posterior sheath, put in some mesh, make a hole in the mesh, deliver it through, and what you have is an ostomy that's reinforced at the new site on the contralateral side. You've got a midline that's widely covered with mesh, and you have an old stoma site that has mesh covering the entire thing, okay? This is a pretty good operation. Um, but the downside is two things. Number one, if you think about how that ostomy comes through the abdominal wall, it comes through the posterior layer, the mesh, the muscle, the fascia, and the skin as three independent layers, and it's very easy to do it wrong or to have scissoring in the retromuscular plane that causes ischemia or kinks. The second issue is that obviously the mesh, uh, the mesh has been cut around the ostomy site, and it's also been cut um, near the midline. And so as a consequence of that, when people get hernias back, they get them right here. And because you've so widely reinforced the rest of the abdominal cavity, that defect in the mesh becomes an extraordinary defect in terms of the overall pressure of the abdominal wall. It is the only weak spot that is not reinforced with mesh. And so um, while the initial papers on this from Mike Rosen and Yuri Davitsky at Cleveland showed an acceptable risk at 13 months, uh, there are some problems with it. Bowel needs to be moved. You've got multiple wound sites. You've got a lot of bowel mobilization. The mesh is cut. And as I mentioned, there are some problems with the stomas that happen when you take them down and move them to a new location. So the modification that, that we came up with uh, was really a complete accident. I was doing a course um, at the University of uh, Pennsylvania, and it, we were doing a cadaver course with ostomies that we had just created, and somebody wanted to learn how to do a tar, and I said, can we please just leave the stoma up? I don't want to have to deal with cadaver stool. And I was just being lazy. And sure enough, this idea kind of popped into my head. And so we went home and did some additional cadaver work. And so these are our initial cadaver dissections. Um, we gave the cadavers stomas, and then we basically did a retrorectus dissection and did a tar around the ostomy in situ. And here's a wide tar plane. And then we did the thing that we tell you not to do, which is to make a hole in the posterior layer and intentionally then lateralize the bowel, closing lateral to medial, so that all of that bowel is now in the retromuscular space. Um, on the contralateral side, you can do a retrorectus, you can do a tar, whatever you need to do to have a landing zone. And then you put some mesh in, and you can put any kind of mesh that you want in the plane. We initially envisioned it with transfascial sutures. Um, this is what it looks like, and the nice part is that area where the mesh is cut, the mesh is now no longer cut, and you also have not had to take down and move the stoma and redo the mucocutaneous junction. Mike Rosen and his group at the Cleveland Clinic did the initial study on this, and they did 38 patients. And again, they had an 11% recurrence rate. The biggest issues that they saw were in the early phases, uh, some erosions. They had two patients with perforations on day eight and day 12. 
this is a learning curve of this operation. These are configured too tightly. Okay. If you have a perforation on day eight at your new stoma site, it's just too tight. They had one patient who came back at four months with an ischemic stoma. That patient had fistulizing Crohn's and an endiliostomy on the left-hand side and also had an early obstruction that eventually resolved. So probably was also pretty tight at the same time. Um, we ultimately eliminated transfascial sutures, and we realized a couple things. We'd eliminated them from our other repairs, and we realized you also don't need those sutures to keep bowel from getting up. Um, so if you eliminate transfascial sutures, then one of the things you can do is lateralize the bowel any way you want. So if you have an ileostomy, the mesentery doesn't go lateral, it goes inferior. If you've got a urostomy, it goes straight down toward the myopectineal orifice. That's where the ureters are located. If you've got an end colostomy, it goes towards the upper quadrant. And so the word lateral, when we think about lateralizing a stoma, to me, no longer means going lateral to allow sutures to go through the muscular abdominal wall. You can lateralize inferior. You can lateralize superior. The only thing you can't do is really lateralize across the midline, because if you do that, you have an area where there's fascia closed with bowel underneath, but no mesh reinforcement, okay? So you really can't cross the midline with it. So getting rid of those transfascial sutures also did the following thing. You know, I worried that when we put the mesh right to the edge of the bowel, we weren't covering additional areas. And so we changed our mesh configuration as well. And this is sort of what I do now. Um, here, this is us putting the mesh in. We've already tucked it on the near side of the dissection. And I'm going to push that out to the edge where it sits very loosely against the, the bowel entering the retromuscular plane. And then all we're going to do is take some scissors. And rather than cutting off that mesh and throwing it out, I'm simply going to make a slit in the mesh. And then we're going to wrap the tails of the mesh around the bowel where it enters the retromuscular plane. So this is keyhole in the area where the bowel enters the retromuscular plane. And it's then essentially sugar bakered for the remainder of the repair. I don't suture those keyholes together. I just wrap it around there. Again, this is a little bit of laziness, but it turns out it actually makes the mesh sit very nicely. And you can see both the sugar baker and the keyhole configurations there. Um, if you want to think about mesh choice, uh, this study uh, just came out uh, looking at contaminated fields, about 50-50 biologic mesh and synthetic. Um, but interestingly enough, they looked at the mesh configuration and all of the erosions in the series from, from bowel were in the cruciate configurations, none with a retromuscular sugar baker. And if you compare the, the re reoccurrence rates there, uh, 30 versus 10 was not statistically significant, but I'll take a clinically relevant but not statistically significant difference any day of the week. So I'll conclude the repair has evolved over the course of time based off of those anatomic configurations. The key concept of retromuscularization of the bowel remains. Um, but there are some complications that you need to learn how to do. I showed earlier in the day today a, a, a mesh fracture after this operation. I will say all of the versions of the surgery are quite challenging, and you should really have a good grasp of a lot of different types of repairs, I think, before you take this on. Uh, with that, I'll conclude. Thank you very much.